Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duart. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. On Fridays, we talk about the product owner role in Scrum. We talk about patterns and anti-patterns that relate to ours and the team's collaboration with the product owner. And we've also put together a course to help you navigate that relationship. There's 18 modules, nearly eight hours of tools, techniques, videos, handouts, presentations you can use to help you and your team work better with your product owner. The course is available at bit.ly forward slash coach your PO. All lowercase, all one word, that's bit.ly forward slash coach your PO. And now on to the show, the product owner show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our TGIF Friday and product owner episode this week with Tomo Lennox. Hi, Tomo. Welcome back. Hi, my honor to be back. So, Tomo, Fridays is the product owner episode, and uh, we'll talk about what a great product owner looks like in a bit. But first, let's share with our listeners out there what might be potentially the worst product owner anti-pattern you've seen in your career. And let me just say that I think... Product owner is a hard role. It's it's a big role. To do to be a really great product owner, ideally, you really understand the team, you really understand agile, you really understand the product and the customer. Um, you have to wear pretty big shoes to be excellent at this. And and not many people I know are are that close to excellent. So Usually the problems I get are are people just aren't quite up to it. They, you know, it'll take them 10 years to be an expert in the product and they've had two. And and they just got their product owner class last month, you know, and they're not quite sure how this Scrum thing works. Okay, go, be a product owner, right? That's a hard place to put people. So walk us through what that means in practice from the team's perspective like what you just described what will the team see what are the things happening when people product owners are put in that position mm-hmm. so usually what i get is somebody who's kind of mechanical there's a there's a backlog stuff kind of goes into the backlog you know there's some kind of shuffling of priority of the backlog you know and then they do the stuff in the backlog it gets approved and you know if there's some big intelligence behind it it's a mystery to everybody. It just kind of kind of flows kind of automatically. You don't see that insight or say, uh, you know, that solution isn't going to work because of this. Like, we'll have to come up with a better one. Or this is really hot. You know, can you guys find a solution? Because if we can do this, you know, we will make a we will make a lot of money really fast. You know, when you see those insights, you know that someone someone's got the big picture and they're they're looking for for good solutions. But in people who just aren't quite up to it yet, you just don't get any flashes of insight at all. And as you you know, in in the product owners you've interacted with in your career, what are some of the reasons why people might fall into this mechanical aspect, right? Just putting stuff in the backlog. And again. One of the big problems I've seen is that corporate financial systems have this old waterfall concept of, you know, every year we come up with a budget and then we implement it the rest of the year. And, and then we have the, uh, the uh, budget approval committee. And if you have a new idea, you propose it to them. And the next quarter, they put it on their list. And then the next quarter, they give you the budget for it. So when I'm the product owner and I say, hey, I see an opportunity here. You know, but it's going to require double teams or it's going to require me to not do this and do this. They just don't have permission. So they're just bound by the financial system. Yeah. And and, uh, so I'm thinking of a particular client I worked with and they they had a pretty good uh, planning system in place. They did uh, rolling wave planning. So it wasn't just once a year. It was four times a year, but it was still very much the same as you describe it. And what I saw there is that the product owners were basically burdened with a bunch of deliveries 
that may or may not have anything to do with their vision for the product. I mean, let's assume right. that they do have a vision for the product. They do understand the customer. But when an executive comes to you and say, hey, we want to make this and this much money next quarter, and the salespeople tells us that this is what we need. So we'll do this, right? And it, it sounds to me that one of the problems of that corporate financial budgeting system is not only that it is waterfall, that is part, of course, but it's also that it's not giving the product owner any, um, I mean, it gives product owner responsibility, but not responsibility to come up with the product, only right. to execute, almost as if they were making product owners project managers instead. That's right. That's right. And they don't really have any freedom to say, we're not going to do this. You know, we thought we were going to do this, but it doesn't look good. Let's not do it. Let's do this instead. You can't do that. That, that money's already been allocated. The charge number has already been set up. You know, it's already been allocated to the programmers. Of course, we're going to do it, even if it doesn't make any money. And this, of course, is not an easy problem to solve because, for example, if you need, for example, double teams, like you just said, somebody needs to approve that cost, right? Mm -hmm. And in the good old world, what you, what would happen is that you would create a fake business case. I mean, all business cases are fake. They are fiction. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. a really fake business case to inflate the expectation of income so that you could go out and hire another team, which would invariably take a few months to hire. And then after that, they would have been tasked with delivering something that was thought up maybe even 12 months before, which obviously wouldn't be in line with the market needs anymore. So I, I think that there's a, a very big part of how we put these budgets together. And uh, for us as Scrum Masters is also a point of understanding that it's very hard to help a product owner when there's all of these financial systems in the background pushing them to do stuff that has been planned, you know, three, six, 12 months ago. Right. That, that inflexibility there just makes it hard to do anything as a product owner. And now, if you could get rid of that, there'd be a huge burden on the product owner's shoulders because now they're going to make or break the product, right? They, they're going to say, let's try this. And it fails. And then what do you do? Fire them? You say, okay, try it again, right? That's the right answer. And then the third time you say, well, now you're experienced, you know, go out the fourth time and, you know, make money. That's, that's how the old joke goes. But uh, in, in, in real life, there's so many check and balances in the financial system. The product owner can't actually do anything. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something we really need to take into account. For those of you wanting to know more about what this is and perhaps alternatives, there's uh, you can look into Beyond Budgeting, which is a, a, a movement uh, that Excellent. tries to address the financial planning in large organizations and how to make that more agile. So definitely a lot of stuff there that is worth looking into and learning from. Yes, that's, the that's I think, the biggest problem for product owners, just trying to get some space where they can make decisions. Tomo, that was the anti-pattern, and now we turn our attention to the opposite, the mirror image, what might have been potentially the best product owner you've ever worked with. Describe them for us. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, so I want to say something radical that I was reading um, uh, Klaus Leopold's Rethinking Agile, and he had this wonderful system for solving all those financial problems and getting people to work together. And I, I read that and I thought, wow, this is really great. And I sat back and realized, oh, there's no product owner. He left the product owner out. And, and it came up with a system that works. I thought, wow, could that really work? I'm, I'm anxious to try it. Because in my mind, there's always the product owner, right? There's always the Steve Jobs somewhere who, who, who you know, has the vision, who drives people to places they never would have thought of going because this guy's got the vision. And so now I'm in my head trying to, trying to figure out, do you really need a great product owner? Or or can a company pursue success by themselves? Mm, I don't know. So talk to us a little bit more about that. What is that system that does not include a product owner? And uh, why might it be interesting for us as Scrum Masters to study it? Mm -hmm. So in this system, there's three levels. The, the bottom level is teams, just like we know, teams working on, on stuff. But then there's a middle level, which is the end-to-end -end part for the products or the projects or whatever structure you have, where multiple teams might work on it. And then at the top level is the corporation with its strategies and initiatives and things like that. 
And he's got a clever kind of way for those to coordinate so that the executives can actually set some directions that can be implemented in products, products, whatever. And then teams can pick up pieces of it and, and do it. And so I thought that was a very clever way of uh, having more conversations and more coordination, but it involves the company leading. And then, you know, you could put product owners on each of those middle products, I think. And I think that would work. But but I don't remember him saying anywhere in the book. I read through it and I thought he didn't mention that, but they, they could be there. So I, I think the one of the aspects that I wanted to highlight from that is the need to have this link between what is the implementation uh, proper, so what the teams do in the end, and what is the coming up with ideas and thoughts and experiments to put out in the market and validate our assumptions, right? Yes. And what I hear it's you public. say is that this system might actually bring those different perspectives together. Is that what you mean? So uh, the discovery process, I think, is really, really important that we we just dump everything we think somebody might want into the backlog, and then we just try to do it at some priority. Uh, but maybe we shouldn't do it. Maybe it doesn't line up with our strategy. You know, maybe we should test it to see if it's going to be a good value first. So I absolutely think that that's a piece that's missing from the way most people do Agile. Um, and if you had somebody who was there, I think they would learn a lot. And then I think they could they could have that vision. It's hard for groups to have vision. So presumably, if we have a product owner who's who's really pulling their weight, they have the vision. You know, again, I say Steve Jobs. You know, who who got teams to places they would never be. And of course, he was a tyrant too. Huh? How do I reconcile these? I don't know, but. <laughs> But but somehow he invented things that, that didn't exist before. And it's hard to just put a bunch of teams in a room and say, go invent something great. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that uh, uh, there's a lot we can learn from uh, uh, visionaries like, like Steve Jobs or others. Uh, I think one important aspect for me in the product owner role is that the team is the engine that transforms ideas into reality but somebody needs to tell the team where that reality is going to be when they are ready to release, right? And of course, it's very easy to say in Scrum is the product owner. That's incredibly easy. Scrum already defines that. But the question is, how do you get that product owner? How do you get that person that can help the team go in a direction that they didn't even think was possible to begin with? So Lean Startup says, you know, you're the team, find the customer, connect the dots, you know, go go do it. The customer is the, you know, who you're chasing. So could you do it without a product owner? I guess so. But it, it uh, seems like great products have a vision. And, and, the, and that's always, in my opinion, that's always a person. Yeah, that's a very good point. Great products have a, have a vision, and that's always a person. Uh, so I'll put the link in the show notes to Lean Startup, also the uh, uh, process that started the whole movement called customer development, so that people can go in and check it out and, and learn more about that. Uh, Tomo, unfortunately, we're getting close to the end. Uh, but before we go, do share with us, where can we find out more about you and the work that you're doing? I am uh, TomoLennox.com. My website's out there, and I'll be putting more and more things out there, hopefully, on uh, on what I've learned. So hopefully you can keep track of me there. From there, you can get to um, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. I'm the only Tomo Lennox in the world. Easy to find. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, Tomo, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much for being here and for your generosity with your time and your knowledge. I'm honored that you called on me. Thank you. One more week of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast is over. But there's a lot more we have to share. We have developed our own membership site where you find a community of active and engaged Scrum Masters. In this site, you get access to exclusive content and get to interact with us, your podcast hosts, as well as the best Scrum Masters in the world. Join us at scrummastertoolbox.com forward slash podcast and keep this podcast free of advertising. See you next week for one more week full of Scrum Master tips and tricks. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. 
Remember that sharing is caring.